So welcome to our US policy uh, event for entrepreneurs. Uh, that music you heard was Policy of Truth from Depeche Mode. So glad you all were able to join us. My name is Jason Grillo with Air Miners. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today and to welcome our panel. In terms of why we're doing our panel today, we are at a certainly a moment in carbon removal where we are experiencing a much more favorable policy environment than we've ever seen. That's why having entrepreneurs in uh, carbon removal able to uh, ask questions of those who are most knowledgeable of these changing trends is, the, is, is a crucial part of what we want to provide for the larger carbon removal industry. There are enhanced ways of capturing carbon, storing carbon, both by uh, more engineered and more, more by natural solutions as well. So any method of carbon removal is likely going to benefit from the particulars of the new policies that have just been enacted in the US. That includes not just the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, but the CHIPS Act, and also the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act from last year. To that end, we have uh, Matt Kennedy, entrepreneur at Moat Hydrogen, CEO and co-founder, as well as a panel of Caroline Normiel, Danny Broger, Berg from Bipartisan Policy Center, and Jaron Goddard from Wilson, Cincinnati, Goodrich, and Rosati. Uh, so with that, just a small housekeeping note, we're going to have more of a Q&A today uh, rather than a, a panel discussion. So we asking you for your questions. Mac has a couple of questions teed up already uh, to ask of the panel. And uh, then we will turn it over to you. So ask your questions in the Zoom chat. I will filter those up to Mac. Mac can ask them of the panel and we will go from there. Uh, note this is being recorded for uploading and viewing on our Airminders YouTube channel later, so that even if you aren't able to attend all of today, you can still appreciate the and learn from the rich insights that I'm sure are going to follow. Uh, as a final note, at the very top of the program, at, at the top of the hour rather, we stop the recording and then we can hang out in a Zoom breakout, in Zoom breakout rooms if you want for maybe a half an hour afterwards. If you can make it, that'd be fantastic. But everyone's extraordinarily busy, so don't feel obligated to. It's our way of getting to know each other, not just know of each other, if that makes sense. Uh, so and without further ado, I'm going to cede the floor to Mac. Mac, please. Jason, thanks so much for having me. Um, man, this is a, a really exciting time to be in carbon removal. Um, and air miners is really where this conversation is happening. So. I'm really excited by this opportunity today to, to have this discussion. And um, um, yeah, really amazing panel we have here. Uh, my name is Matt Kennedy. I'm the CEO of a company called Moat. Uh, we take woody waste biomass and convert it into hydrogen uh, to replace fossil fuels and then CO2 for, for storage or utilization. Um, really excited to be um, a member of the air miners community. Um, you know, this is really where these kind of uh, frontier conversations are happening and um, so, so not surprised that we're uh, having the conversation on this platform today. Um, would like to start off by um, introducing this this really great panel that we have, who I think is uniquely qualified to uh, to talk about kind of the changes we've seen um, to the landscape recently, uh, most notably with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so, um, I'd love to kick it off, uh, hand it over um, to Caroline to start off with introductions, um, and then we can kind of go around the horn. Thanks so much, Mac. Um, and thanks, Jason, also um, for the invitation to be here. Uh, really excited for this discussion. It's, it's as has been noted, a really exciting time um, to be working in, in carbon removal and management. Uh, my name is Caroline Normile. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, and I am supporting our nature-based solutions portfolio in agriculture, forestry, grasslands, um, my background is in terrestrial carbon cycling, so really excited um, to bring that, that lens to bear um, on the land uh, side of CDR. And with that, I will turn it to my colleague, Danny. Thanks, Caroline. Um, hi, everyone. Really happy to be here. I am also a senior policy analyst at the Bipartisan Policy Center. 
Um, quick note on BPC, if you, if you weren't aware of, of who we are, um, we're a federal policy focused think tank here in Washington, DC. Um, and we firmly believe that bipartisan legislation is the best way to create durable policy solutions as it's sort of in the name, the B and the BPC. Um, uh, you know, it's not always easy to sort of go this route of, of bipartisanship, but it pays huge dividends when you're able to pass bipartisan policies. Um, so you'll notice that as a, as a theme of, of what me and Caroline might be talking about today is, is uh, carbon removal and carbon management um, enjoy a lot of bipartisan support um, for a number of reasons, which you can go on uh, further into later on. Um, my background is um, in material science. I was formerly a, a, a computational material scientist working on point defects um, for any of the engineers in the room and uh, came to policy through a fellowship called the AAAS Fellowship, where I worked for Senator Chris Coons uh, from Delaware, um, worked on his carbon management portfolio while I was there. Um, and now I head up our engineered carbon removal portfolio um, and carbon management as well. You know, I also cover point source carbon capture, transport, storage, all of these issues that I know you all are very familiar with. Um, but looking forward to this discussion today. And I'll pass it to Jaron. Hey everyone, um, great to um, great to meet everybody on this call. Um, my name is Jaron Goddard. I'm a um, energy attorney um, with Wilson Cincini. We're based in San Francisco, but I am now in Seattle. Very happy to be on the best coast from uh, a few years in DC. Um, so kind of my nexus to this uh, um, uh, this event today is you both a practicing attorney in our energy and clean uh, excuse me um, energy and climate solutions group, um, and then also most recently served um, as a chief counsel and climate policy advisor for U.S. Senator Patty Murray. Um, so it's very just you know, good timing, fortunate to be on the Hill when we negotiated, um, we now refer to as the bill, so the bipartisan infrastructure law, the heck of an acronym for um, a law, but the bill, um, and then what is now the IRA, but at the time when I was there was um, Build Back Better, BBB. We're just full of acronyms, of course. Um, so really excited to be here, um, shed a little bit of light on kind of some more nitty gritty questions about 45Q, about kind of regulatory timeline. And my practice in particular is much more on the regulatory and project development side. Um, I wait a little bit into the project finance side to the extent now, especially with the IRA is really changing um, the landscape for um, tax equity financing and everything else. So um, happy to be here. I will lastly just say that, um, you know, and I know we actually all, the four of us discovered, we were all sort of former Hill colleagues, not necessarily overlapping, um, but um, BPC is just a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, and someone I went to really frequently when I was a staffer. Um, so um, I just want to give a shout out to that. So thanks. One, one final thing, Jaron, any disclaimers you want to announce? Yes, sure, of course. Um, thanks for the reminder, Jason. Um, yeah, so um, obviously I, I can keep everything high level today. Um, any sort of individualized questions anyone might have um, that, you know, very specific to your business, I'm happy to talk about that um, offline or separately. Um, you know, nothing I'm saying today is legal advice. I'm sorry, I have to be, be the lawyer here and give the disclaimer. <laughs> um, but just, just so that's very clear, but happy to have any offline discussions about any of your individualized questions. Awesome. Well, we have uh, some some really great uh, questions that we've got from the audience, um, and and there's no better panel than this, I think, to to, to really kind of um, go through uh, these recent changes to uh, the, the landscape. Um, so, I mean, I think the the best way to really start this conversation is, you know, what are the standouts to you all in terms of you know the main ways that the Inflation Reduction Act is going to influence. Uh, carbon dioxide removal startups. Um, you know, what stands out to you all? And, um, you know, I think that's probably gonna be a good starting point for uh, for kicking off this conversation. So whoever wants to, to take that first and run with it, um, please go ahead. I'm happy to jump on the mic first. Um, yeah, and I um, will selfishly broaden this question a bit um, because I, I think it's relevant to take a step back and, and think about, uh, everything that has passed for carbon management and carbon removal in the past two years. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act is, um, you know, was, is a monumental bill. Um, and, you know, this, this is a line I've, I've said frequently in panels in the past few weeks, but um, uh, uh, the, the way that the IRA was passed was through something called reconciliation, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but um, sort of intrinsically becomes a, um, a partisan pass, uh, pathway to, to passing legislation. And so as such, the BPC, you know, 
doesn't formally endorse that kind of pathway. Um, but what's really important about the IRA is that it includes um, over 20 bipartisan bills, um, primary, especially in the energy and climate space. And this is something that's really worth acknowledging that while this passed through a reconciliation pathway, um, it's full of, of bipartisan priorities and, and that's worth keeping in mind. Um, but then if you also look at the past, the previous two years, we've got the Energy Act of 2020, the IIJA or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, choose your acronym. Um, and then we've got CHIPS and Science, which actually passed just like a week before, I, I think it got signed into law like a week before the IRA. Um, all of these have a tremendous number of opportunities for carbon management and carbon removal, which we can talk about today. Um, and you know we could easily give you a lecture on this for, for uh, eight hours if we, if we wanted to, but we only got one hour today and wanna to focus on what you all are interested in. Um, I think, you know, I would imagine that a lot of the conversation today might touch on 45Q. Um, and so I, I kind of want to start with that. Um, and that might actually be the only thing I comment on before I, I let others on the microphone. Um, so the 45Q tax credit is a tax credit that's been around for um, over a decade and um, previously applied to point source carbon capture. Um, and it's a dollar per ton of carbon captured, right? Um, and so in that way, it's sort of like a production tax credit for capturing CO2. Um, and you know, historically, um, the most before the IRA, um, there were some challenges to monetizing the credit, especially for in the case of direct air capture or carbon removal. Um, and what the IRA has done is it's extended the credit to 2033, um, but it's increased the value of the credit to $180 per ton for direct air capture that's uh, uh, paired with uh, dedicated saline storage. Um, which is a game changer. Uh, and we can go more into that with that uh, $180 amount um, coupled with the voluntary carbon markets and maybe the LCFS from California, that's, that's really starting to get to what it takes to, to do direct air capture as um, you know, people who work on DAC in this room will be familiar with. Um, there are some nuances about how you actually get the $180 per uh, ton payout. Um, and I think Jaron might wanna cover a little bit of that. Um, there's the sort of bonuses for prevailing wage and apprenticeship um, that she would do a much better job of, of sort of over, uh, giving an overview for. Um, but then, you know, a couple other notable changes um, relevant to direct air capture in particular. Um, they decreased the minimum plant size from 100,000 tons to 1,000 tons. So, um, you know, for context, uh, the Orca facility in Iceland is 4,000 tons, um, the world's biggest plant today. Um, so. At 100,000 tons, if that was your uh, lower bound for participating in the credit, that just wasn't realistic for direct or capture to claim the credit um, before the IRA passed. Um, now it's 1,000 ton, 1, tons per year. So anyone thinking about these pilot scale projects um, that can hit that level can start monetizing the 45Q credit next year. Um, there's a couple other provisions um, sort of relating to design capacities, but that, that's kind of more for Point source carbon capture, capture. Um, but you know, I think probably the, the last thing I'll, I'll leave with that you um, is perhaps the biggest thing for the tax credits that has so, sort of an interesting political story um, is is direct pay, which um, is the ability to sort of receive the tax the the amount from the tax credit without having uh, the tax liability um, that is required normally for for claiming a tax credit. So in, in a sense, even though they're not called grants, it basically is a grant um, it, it, in, when, you, when you enact this direct pay provision. Um, for the purposes of 45Q, uh, that direct pay is only for the first five years. Um, but then for the seven years after that first five years, um, you can still do something called um, transferability, um, which is uh, related um, and also super important for, for monetizing the credit. And maybe Jaron uh, can give you some more of the legalese on, on all that. But um, uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there because I would love to have this conversation going forward. And I see a bunch of questions popping in the chat already. Um, so may, maybe I'll yield the floor to Jaron, if that makes sense for continuing. Uh, sure thing. Um, thanks, Danny. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I also see we have a very special guest, James. Um, somebody, well, a little tiny guest there. Um, hello. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. So, so as as Danny was saying, you know, the big structural thing about 45Q, which 
you know, enables you to claim sort of the, uh, there's like the, the base and bonus kind of structure, um, which I will just say is it to Danny's point about it, this being a reconciliation bill, one conceptual thing that's really important to keep in mind as you're reading through the bill is that reconciliation bills, every single word, every single line has to have a budgetary impact. So when you're kind of thinking through why, or like you're having sort of a, um, this doesn't make sense, or a sort of like um, sort of seeking clarity on something, sort of every kind of piece of policy inside not just 45Q but throughout the bill had to have a budgetary effect, which is again why you see um, this um, kind of you know base and bonus um, uh, credit structure that we see in 45Q. So just as kind of a um, reader's digest guide to, to looking at this. Um, so the thing that unlocks that that bonus is the prevailing rate of apprenticeship requirements. Um, where we differ from the ITC and PTC, both the extension and then the transition to the tech neutral ITC and PTC, is there are not, um, you know, adders for things like domestic content, um, energy communities, low income uh, communities, and so forth. So those are those are not applicable for 45Q. But so for the prevailing wage, I think the main points I want to make are this. Um, so, so first and foremost, um, they apply both during. So the they're important to keep. Uh, in separate buckets in your mind. Prevailing wage applies um, during construction and for the 12 years thereafter. Um, apprenticeship requirements only apply during construction. The idea of both of those, if you know, for those of you who kind of aren't familiar with, <clears throat> with those labor practices, the reason why both are in there is both to provide, you know, high paying, good paying jobs and the apprenticeship is sort of a, you know, training pathway. We're trying to increase the um, skilled workforce um, in, in all, across all all of these sectors. So that's why those exist. Um, one thing, so, so that's one structural. Number two, I think it's really important to keep in mind that while we're waiting for treasury guidance on um, a lot more of the sort of nitty gritty of how it'll all get, um, you know, basically applied, there'll be a waiver process, right? Like if you can't find apprentices, um, there's sort of, and that some of that is actually spelled out in the law. Um, but the compliance regime for this, I think we can expect it to be less than what we see for, um, you know, the how it is applied basically across federal awards and contracts as we see now. So if you've got any familiarity with this, um, if you're complying with prevailing wage, like because you're doing direct procurement with the federal government, those are pretty onerous uh, and really significant compliance costs. So that's you're submitting, for example, like a certified payroll every week, uh, like during during the construction of your project, for example. Here, the idea, and of course, you know, Treasury is, you know, kind of the ultimate, you know, arbiter here. Um, I think the idea here, and I can use sort of certainly can say from you know my discussions with some, some former colleagues. Um, is that the intent is that the compliance regime is not going to be quite as stringent. Um, of course, they, they want and will demand compliance if you're claiming that that um, uh, bonus credit. Um, but I just, all I need to say is that it's, it's important to view it through that lens when you're thinking about um, all of the sort of compliance risks involved with that. To that end, the risks for non-compliance, um, they're, they're severe, right? So you're not only paying basically back wages if you're found not in compliance with prevailing wage, but you're also paying a fine, a basically a fee on every single worker um, that, that was not in compliance. Um, if you reach something called intentional disregard, meaning that you didn't even try, um, treasury your friends, you didn't even try, those fees are um, tripled. And so um, the, the Failure to not comply is is significant. Um, you do get sort of this, um, you know, half a year kind of a cure period where you know treasury might come back to you and say like, hey, we found some irregularities. You get the sort of like opportunity to cure that. Um, uh, but I just want to note that you know the the penalties for non-compliance are um, significant. But I think the compliance regime, like the costs that you will have to incur in complying with it, would be less than in a like federal procurement or award context. So that's also really important. And I think that's kind of also another incentive to really, um, really try to make this happen, right? Like both, both to unlock the, the adder credit, um, also because it is the right thing to do to pay workers, um, uh, you know, as, as, as high as is, you know, like uh, um, feasible under your business model. Um, and, and, you know, also to not run afoul of sort of uh, a treasury enforcement there. But um, those are the big things I wanted to say about prevailing wage. Um, the last thing I'll head on before, um, you know, in the end, 
is to have an open conversation. Transferability, Danny made a really good point about both transferability and direct pay. These concepts are sort of designed to work together. Um, it was great that 45Q, unlike the ITC and PTC and some of the other credits for which um, you know, uh, taxpayers with federal tax liability are not eligible for direct pay. Across most of them, it's only the tax exempts, uh, nonprofits, government entities like that. Of course, that's not the case here. For transferability, um, uh, one thing I want to sort of note globally is that a lot of this will be really subject to treasury guidance. The idea in a transferability regime is that it helps enable those who have a hard time accessing tax equity finance, find basically create a new kind of market for these credits basically, um, and it helps you sort of monetize them. Um, there are things we don't know, which is that, you know, in a regular tax equity financing, you know, your tax equity investor is the one actually claiming the credit. They have to be an investor in the project, right? Like they actually have to be, you know, for the purposes of the credit, put, you know, putting it into service. Um, for a transferee transferor relationship, that's really different, right? Like there is still some financial skin in the game for the purposes of the tax code, you know, Title 26 and um, uh, uh, kind of recapture rules. I think those are, it's pretty clear in the text that those will still apply, um, uh, you know, to transferors, those actually claiming the credit, or excuse me, transferees. Um, but I, I think it's, the, the intent of these is to be different. Um, I have already heard from some clients, for example, of sort of like asking some questions about like, uh, does, does the transferability regime like really mean actually anything different for tax equity financing? Um, and, you know, I think a response is that um, for those that have a, you know, already easy time accessing tax equity financing, the transferability might not be as applicable or, or important. But for those that, that don't, I think it is pretty significant. But we will need, and I think Treasury will prioritize getting out guidance um, that helps clarify exactly where both legal financial risk lies in that transferability so that it enables you to make some clear decisions about that. Um, and related also kind of what the margin on this is gonna be like, I don't know, and I don't know if anybody knows whether they can tell you whether your credit's gonna be 98 cents on the dollar, 95 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar. Like we don't know, the market doesn't exist yet. Um, and I think anybody can tell you, but um, at least with any sort of certainty, but um, just something to watch for for more guidance. I also think to the extent you guys are involved in industry organizations and those um, kind of both, you know, lobbying or directly trying to, trying to educate um, uh, Treasury and other officials on these things. If there are questions that come up, I mean, part of, you know, what everyone is trying to figure out is um, what would be helpful to enable sort of longer decision making is something really helpful to start thinking through right now. So, so that can be sort of, um, you know, those educational components can be um, I will stop there and then hand over to Caroline. Thanks so much, Jaren. Um, I think a, a great segue, uh, I'll, I'll tee this up for you, Caroline, is um, get a good question from Kate Murphy on how broadly is direct air capture defined in 45Q? Would nature-based technologies qualify? Does it require a, a concentrated CO2 stream? You know, how, how do we think about that? Yeah, that's a great question and a tough one. Um, and I know one that, that folks are really wrestling with. With regard to the specifics around 45Q, um, I would uh, probably turn that turn that back to, to Danny, our resident expert on that. But before I do, I'll just note um, that there are a lot of overlaps with um, practices that are eligible for funding, um, whether loans or grants through existing USDA conservation programs. Um, for example, biochar production is eligible under um, the conservation stewardship program within USDS, USDA, excuse me, um, as applied to, you know, as a soil amendment for um, ag and forest soils. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it to Danny with regard to the tax credit element. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Um, I knew I knew this question was going to come up with this group. It's a very fair question. Um, but I, I guess the way I would answer is, um, you know, the question of, of uh, what is eligible under 45Q is, is pretty, um, you know, historically, this was a point source carbon capture uh, tax credit. Um, that's sort of the origin of all this. And there's a lot of language in the statute about using industrial, uh, 
capture facilities to do this. And a lot of language about um, not using photosynthesis to capture the CO2. So um, with those two things combined, um, I, I, the definition of direct air capture is, is pretty explicit. And actually what I'll do is I'm just gonna drop the, uh, the, the most recent uh, statutory language for 45Q. If you feel like reading some legalese while we're um, you know, talking through this, um, uh, it's already been updated. It recently has been updated with, with the IRA changes. So um, that, that probably took a second for the, the house lawyers to figure out, but um, uh, maybe, maybe I'll stop at that. If, if someone wants to like refine the question about what qualifies for 45Q, happy to, but um, I'll just, I guess I would, I would end it with, um, uh, you know, a lot of this is still being figured out. Um, things are remain to be seen in terms of how EPA and IRS is going to issue guidance. Um, but also, there's going to be there's going to need to be um, sort of additional policies to support the full suite of carbon management and carbon removal solutions that we want. Um, but also, it doesn't all have to be 45Q. It's just the plug I, I would throw out there. Um, there's plenty of funding for carbon removal to go around. Um, something we haven't mentioned yet is the Chips Act authorized the carbon removal program at DOE at $1 billion. Um, and for context, uh, before 2019, all uh, carbon removal funding was, I think, $10 million for the past, for the previous 10 years. Um, so that's two orders of magnitude increase um, over the next three years. Um, and so, you know, a, an important policy priority for us at BPC and others in DC um, is going to be making sure we fund carbon removal at, at the level that it needs to be funded through, through DOE in, in subsequent appropriation cycles. Um, so I went on a rant there, but I, I guess there's a broader conversation to be had about the, the appropriate policy tool to support every form of carbon management, which we need to address climate change. Uh, Danny, we, we had a comment from uh, Andy Waters, which I think maybe plays well into this, which is, I mean, first off, is there a maximum number of years you can claim 45Q? And does claiming 45Q prevent selling carbon credits? How does that uh, tie in? Yeah, Jaron might also be able to step in on this, but that um, the recent changes were, I um, mean, claim it for 12 years. Um, and um, like I was saying earlier, direct pay only applies for the first five years, but then you're allowed to do transferability for the rest of the time. Um, uh, with the exception being if you're a nonprofit or a, a tribe, I think is correct. Um, and in terms of uh, offsets, yes, you can you can still monetize offsets in conjunction with 45Q tax credits, um, is my understanding. Um, Jaron, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I don't. That's actually the first um, I've heard that question, so I'm I'm happy to look at that more. But I I would generally agree with you, Danny. And um, how does biochar fit, if at all? Um, maybe I can turn this over to everyone. I mean. Um, I guess it's a broader question than 45Q only, but maybe how does the, the recent um, changes kind of just affect biochar and you know, how should we think about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and, and kind of maybe reiterate and provide a little more information about um, how it relates with regard to um, you know, the USDA side of things. Um, the term biochar and pyrolysis don't appear explicitly um, in the IRA. But because uh, they are practices, um, their, their production and application to the land are eligible for funding um, within existing programs. And those programs got a huge influx through IRA. Um, so in that way, um, some of these programs, conservation programs, including the Conservation Stewardship Program at USDA, um, you know, which is currently oversubscribed as are a number of these, um, that, that will provide more resources for folks who want to engage in biochar production and application um, to apply for funding. Sorry, it looks like we got a uh, follow-up about not even for 45Q, even lower brackets. Right. So um, as it stands, the statute for 45Q would, um, does not mean that biochar is eligible. Um, that's sort of the, the, the most up-to-date um, you know, guidance from EPA and IRS. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, as Caroline was saying, there's, there's a lot of uh, very important funding streams at um, USDA and, and other, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, 
Carolyn, maybe you could speak to the funding levels from the, the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that went towards those programs. Um, that's that's one relevant area where RoboBioChar is getting funding. But I, you know, an, another area I would highlight is, um, you know, I at least as I understand it, I'm not an expert in biochar by any means, but um, at least as I understand it, a lot of these sort of co-benefits in addition to CO2 storage are sort of the motivation for biochar. Um, and with that in mind, uh, carbon accounting is really super important for that subfield, in my opinion. And that is an area that did get some some funding. Um, uh, you know, getting our ducks in a row about how we're actually going to count carbon um, going into the future. And, um, you know, in the IRA, there were some provisions around um, uh, sort of environmental product declarations, which, you know, is, is a buzzword for the community that cares about procurement of low carbon concrete. Um, but that also sort of goes in the direction of, of quality accounting practices and, and the government, you know, demonstrating what's needed and, and what needs to be um, you know, documented for MRV purposes. Um, so I, I, I would say that's relevant, but Carolyn, do you have anything else to add sort of on the funding levels for biochar relevant programs? Yeah, well, I'll just also piggyback on what you were saying um, about the quantification element, which I think is a huge one, um, particularly for nature-based um, CDR um, in the Inflation Reduction Act um, provisions for uh, conservation. Uh, there's 300 million um, provided for uh, USDA to carry out a program to quantify carbon sequestration um, and emissions reductions, um, including methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide um, through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So to really um, beef up and expand monitoring, measurement, um, and quantification um, of you know what's currently happening on the ground, um, but also as a result of um, a range of conservation practices to better link the outcomes um, you know in the climate and the environment to changes in activity um, on the land that are already supported by a number of these programs. And just to, to provide a little bit more specifics, um, the conservation stewardship program um, at USDA. Um, was provided through the IRA uh, $3.25 billion. Um, and eligible practices in, in this program include biochar production and application. One, one question I see um, commonly in the, the comments section here is, um, you know, how can companies outside the United States benefit from these policies? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Um, so this is um, this is an answer that really depends on which, like you know, for the credit purposes, and then for federal funding, um, and then actually where that federal funding comes from is like a little bit of a different answer depending on what you're talking about. Um, so I will just say at the outset, if you know, I think it's always advisable, and if <laughs> this sounds sort of self-interested, but but genuinely, like talk to your tax counsel, talk to whomever, you know, your internal um, GC, whomever it is, your outside counsel um, on some of these nuances, because the, the question you want to be asking is, you know, start to identify which federal funding um, and sort of tax opportunities you're looking after have, and you can, you know, that's also something you can talk to an attorney about of like, which is in the realm of reasonable, but have a little bit of a defined sense of that to inform that discussion. So to give you an example, um, the loan programs office, which we haven't touched on here, but got you know literally billions of dollars in additional loan authority. I think it is actually one of the more like um, un not undersold, but just sort of like um, not quite uh, as widely talked about um, kind of financing options that by my calculations, at least like literally doubled the investment in the IRA. So when you see that top line number of the 369 billion that's direct appropriations, the loan authority is scored totally differently and there was over 300 billion um, in loan authority to LPO. Anyway, um, huge opportunity there for application. You actually don't have to be a US entity to, to go after an LPO um, award, for example. The project, of course, I mean, you know, the thing that you are getting financed, of course, must be located in the US. Um, but, you know, so that's sort of, and that's it kind of stands out on its own in some ways. Um, there are, generally speaking, the regulations that govern DOE's um, 
federal words with respect to kind of, you know, what the definition of the like U.S. entity is, you know, gets into some detail about whether you have a parent company that's foreign. Um, and there's a little bit of like more color there that generally governs, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, whether again, like just sort of like your corporate structure. Um, and then the tax credit is sort of a different inquiry. So like I said, the question for you and not to put it back in your court is like, which opportunities are you interested in? And that can kind of inform um, how you go from there. The last thing I would say that um, you might not think of as directly related, but but is in, in many instances is that, well, as I said, 45Q does not have a domestic content requirement. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is an authorizing piece of legislation, meaning it can apply forward respectively forever, very much significantly expanded the domestic content floor. Um, so basically what we're seeing is that, so structurally the way that works is that the Office of Management and Budget takes sort of a lead role in defining domestic content. Um, they have already issued guidance. They've made very clear um, in that guidance that sort of anything, uh, so anything that sort of falls within like um, electricity generation, they even get a little bit broader, is sort of a co covered in the sense that it is an infrastructure project. And so DOE is going through the process right now of, de of determining which of their um, programs basically will be subject to domestic content requirements. That domestic content requirement is actually higher than the domestic content requirement for like the PTC and ITC under the IRA. All of that is to say, and that's not necessarily a like, am I a foreign entity or not, but when it's impacting who your suppliers are, your contract manufacturing relationships, things like this, if you're trying to go after the credit and you're, you know, applying as part of a DAC hub or you know, something else like this, you could be facing a situation where you're subject to domestic content requirements under, under those funding programs. It just needs to be factored into kind of your total and like holistic business planning. So, um, yeah, yeah. Awesome. We had a question from Ryan Anderson in the chat. Um, if direct air capture successfully achieves costs below the 45Q value, it may lose financial additionality for carbon offsets. Can or will the US government then claim the carbon credits to use as internationally transferable credits toward the Article 6 carbon trading provisions? That is a really interesting question. Um, and I'm not gonna venture to um, make a statement on that. I, I think it's just, it's, it's a good question. Uh, financial additionality is very challenging academically to demonstrate obviously. Um, and Article Six is still in flux, and we'll see what happens in the next couple of months uh, or years. Um, but I would just say it's a good question. Sorry, I can't answer it. Um, I guess um, for for the panel, um, to to each of you, what do you think is kind of the biggest unlock of these recent changes? What do you think was previously not viable that is now um, that you're really excited about? There's too many things. I mean, this is a waiting game to see. Where, uh, I mean, I'm I'm just tremendously excited about everything that's happened in the past two years. Um, I, um, you know, just okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a cue from because there's like a hundred ways I could take that that the uh, answer to that question. There, there's just for people who pay attention to Congress, what just happened in the past two years doesn't happen every like often or ever <laughs> um this the, what just happened in the past two years could be like the biggest thing that the u.s has ever done for energy and climate policy and um you know taking a cue from from what sal's question uh was in the chat um i think uh, you know supply chain and sort of uh how we source some of the components of the of the energy tran transition are going to be extremely important and difficult to figure out in, in the US. Um, you know, critical minerals is a buzzword that gets thrown around a lot. Um, we actually recently wrote a blog about how critical minerals actually has a meaning, even though some people just use it as a, as a catch-all for everything in supply chain. Um, it, it's sort of a, a well-defined set of, of elements on the periodic table that USGS refines over time. Um, but, you know, what, what the IRA and, and other bills in the past few years have done is, is sort of given us a fighting chance in the US to, to build up a domestic supply chain. Um, and, and part of that is these sort of tax credits for manufacturing. Um, so, you know, of note from the IRA is, is an extension of the 48C Advanced Energy per, um, uh, 
Ener Advanced Energy Project ITC, um, which is a 30% ITC for clean energy manufacturing. Um, there were some new eligible um, uh, projects under that tax credit. Um, I believe, for example, you know, uh, it's, it's expanded to include carbon capture, utilization, and storage at industrial facilities. Um, and there's also sort of a, a newer requirement. I don't, John, I'm not sure if you have details on this, but that um, uh, if, if a manufacturing facility is investing to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 20%, I, I think there's something there about that and how you're eligible under the credit. Um, is that in 48C or 45X? Uh, so 40, I haven't mentioned 45X, but you, you okay. can. So I, I think that is in 48C. Um, okay. But yeah. yeah, what's super exciting is this new advanced manufacturing production tax credit from 45X. Um, I just pulled up some notes on it. Uh, Jaron, do you, do you want to take that away or? Um... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I, I would, I think, I think 45X, I mean, yes, like on the broad question of like what we're excited about in the bill, 45X is definitely one that I am. I don't know how broadly applicable it'll be to companies here just because of sort of the itemized 45X is the one um, I sort of think of 45X and 45 or 48C is sort of like the ITC and PTC equivalent but as applied to manufacturing and the 45X is technology specific. So you have to qualify, your, your property has to qualify under there and they're itemized. Um, so to the extent that anything does apply to anyone here, 45X is great and very valuable. The one limitation on 48C is um, it is capped at $10 billion. So, <clears throat> I don't recall if there's an application process for it. I think there might be, but one thing we don't know about 48C is whether Treasury will, you know, literally issue that, you know, essentially issue, but make that 10 billion available in year one. Are they going to do it over five years? Are they going to do it over 10 years? So I totally agree with you, Jenny. It's a really, really exciting um, opportunity. Um, I think until we know from Treasury how they're planning on doling that out, it might be a little bit harder to plan your business around it just because. We don't know how the sort of the consistency. I know that they will be striving to make it consistent, such that entities can plan around it. Um, but just just as a note on 48C. Cool. Um, we had uh, a hey, question in the chat about enhanced weathering specifically. Um, Caroline, would you would you want to take that one, um, and how that uh, is affected? Yeah, well, and real, real quick, um, I would just add to the to the broader excitement uh, question. Um, I think, um, you know, as as you know, Danny and, and Jaron have mentioned, there's been so much going on um, investment and you know um, creative ideas um, and policy development around you know innovation and engineering. Um, I think from from the land sector side. Um, you know, even though there was, you know, a broad climate and energy um, economy-wide approach um, in the IRA, um, sectors like forestry and ag sometimes are an afterthought um, in the climate debate. And so uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm um, for getting a, a significant share of the pie here. And it really underscores the importance of really using all the tools in our toolbox and that, you know, nature-based solutions are going to have to be a really significant part of uh, a broader um, climate mitigation portfolio. Um, it also, um, you know, meaningfully recognizes um, and, and kind of validates the environmental stewardship um, that so many folks who, who own and operate the land, um, you know, have done for generations. Um, so I just, kind of wanted to, to drive that point home. I'll also touch on briefly um, that USDA um, today announced um, the uh, award recipients of the Climate Smart Commodities Pilot. Um, and I can share some, some links to the announcements about that, which are really exciting. Um, but they have started with an investment of $2.8 billion um, for uh, activities that enhance um, climate benefits um, across a lot of different types of agriculture and forestry and, and rangelands. Um, so that's um, some of what's you know going on, even apart from all the excitement around IRA, which is which is obviously well founded. Um, I will have to ask you, Mac, to <laughs> repeat the original question that you teed up for me. Yeah, um, I guess maybe two quick questions. I'm not sure who wants to take these, um, but does enhanced weathering count as direct air capture? 
And then how do we define secure geologic storage sites? I don't know if anyone wants to take those. So we can start with secure geologic storage sites. You, your list, people may be familiar with EPA's underground, uh, I had a website pulled up that I was gonna drop in the chat, but um, EPA underground injection control office um, uh, permits, you know, these, these class six wells, which are geologic storage of CO2. Um, and this sort of uh, the, that defines how you claim basically the highest tier of saline storage in, in 45Q. Um, but there, there is sort of a confusing interplay between how IRS issues guidance and EPA issues um, sort of rules and regulations on, on this permitting. So Jaron may be able to comment a little bit on sort of the fuzzy area between what EPA covers and IRS covers, but at least directly answering that second question of what is secure geologic storage, um, it's classic wells at EPA. Um, and uh, the first question was about whether enhanced mineralization is eligible. Um, and my impression is no, as it stands right now. Um, but I think there's sort of a, a spectrum of enhanced mineralization approaches um, that you, know, you could consider at some point in the future with additional changes being eligible under 45Q tax credit. But I, um, my impression is right now, it's not. Someone tell me I'm wrong if I am, but I, that's my impression. Um, we, we did get a question um, in the chat um, about the stacking of uh, new credits. How do we, yeah. how do companies kind of navigate which credits they can maybe put together, which combinations are forbidden? Um, you know, how, how do we kind of process that? That's a great question. I'm curious if Jaron has a broader answer, but I, I think I spotted this question that was sort of uh, benefiting Mac and, and whether he can claim both 45Q and this new 45V tax credit, which is um, a clean hydrogen production tax credit that's tied to emissions intensity. Um, and unfortunately, specifically in that case, I'm, I'm aware that you can't stack 45Q with 45V. So sorry, Mac. Um, but I, I, from a policy design perspective, I kind of understand why they did that. But um, uh, there, there's sort of other specific answers about what's able to stack on a tax credit to tax credit basis that maybe Jaron could answer. Yeah, that, that's right about the intersection between 45Q and 45V. Um, you know, I'm thinking through kind of what else would be applicable. Maybe it is like, you know, 48C, for example, um, to the extent that's applicable. Um, I think it really comes down to the, what we call the eligible basis that you're, you know, applying for. Generally, so like in, in you know, clients that we've spoken to so far, not, not in this space, but for example, in solar, um, solar plus storage, when they're looking at combining the manufacturing credits with an ITC, um, that can, you know, well, and it, it also depends, right? That's, it's not always that the same company is actually literally manufacturing it as the one placing it into service. So like those are also, you know, technicalities and details you definitely want to, you know, speak to a lawyer, tax counsel on. Um, but there are, unless it's sort of directly prohibited, um, you know, you'll just, it's a very factually specific inquiry about the eligible basis you're claiming it um, um, under, under both circumstances. But, you know, 45C is, of course, a fundamentally different provision in terms of what it is pegged to, um, uh, as, as all of the other credits are. So um, that, that's what I'd say. I, I will say generally as well, like, um, if you're interested in, you know, as most or many are, you know, going after a tax credit and also applying for federal funding, whether that's a loan guarantee or federal awards, um, typically, you know, the, those are okay. There is a sort of general kind of no double dipping rule um, across the federal government. More often that applies to things like you're applying for multiple grants, you get multiple grants, you can't, you, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, get $10 or something that costs $5 to type <laughs> this thing um, across two different grants. Um, there is some extent to which tax credits um, intersect if you're like claiming a basis um, for something that you also received a federal grant for. Loan guarantees are a little different um, just because the cost of the federal government of a loan guarantee is a credit subsidy. It's not like a direct appropriation. So anyway, pretty fact specific, but I think the most important thing Danny covered, which is that 45Q and 45V are mutually exclusive. And Jaren, I, I think you put this in the chat, but um, we had some questions about prevailing wage um, any, any thoughts on looking that up and, you know, where people can find more information? 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, so prevailing wage is in this context, it's, it's hyper local. So it's not even like at the state level, like you're going to have to literally go to, I, I can't remember if it's um, even like county level, but it's, it's very, very specific um, to a region. So what you can do um, just to kind of get like a baseline again, like this is these, so Prevailing wages are issued um, kind of every year, so they get updated. Um, so you're not going to find data today is not uh, going to. I mean, it'll be it'll give you a good starting basis to look at it, but it's not going to be the exact rate for you know something uh, you know with a beginning of construction date like the end of next year or 2024. So you'll have to kind of go and look those up. But if you you know, for example, if you're in the state of California, um, they're like you know sort of both. So, depart, there's, so uh, I won't go into too much detail about the sort of intersection between Department of Labor federally and then, um, uh, you know, at the state level. And I should also say there are very much legal ex experts who focus just on these labor issues um, that I think are, are um, you know, can fall out sometimes outside of the scope of even our council here. But um, you can look these up. I think I did see a sort of a really good question in the chat too about, you know, like how does that apply to retrofits if you're not actually, you know, like in a little bit of a different context which workers does that apply to um and all of those details are those details are very much um going to be subject to treasury guidance but my point is is that you can and so i would go to the state that you're in your whatever the equivalent of your state department of labor essentially is going to provide a list um they're going to provide it by sort of like labor type um so then to the question of like well if it's not you know somebody falling under this particular category those are all pretty complicated labor questions. And again, better suited for somebody who's like very much a prevailing wage, like labor law expert in this, but you can go and pull those and start kind of a very basic compare and contrast to kind of what, you know, workers within the scope of their business are being paid now versus what the prevailing wage is for the most applicable kind of job code or job title essentially. I love that answer because I think uh, it shows, you know, the resources are out there to kind of get started and, and really do kind of the feasibility work. Um, but I think ultimately you need a really strong lawyer like Jaron, who can be your partner in, in terms of the strategy of, of putting this together. And, you know, I saw a question about, you know, kind of the tax structuring of different entities for projects. Um, there's so many hyper specific questions that, you know, you really need a good lawyer as your partner um, to, to kind of really uh, maximize the value on the table here. But uh, the resources fortunately are available to kind of get started. Um, so we, we did, um, you know, Maybe, uh, you know, what are we really looking forward to going uh, going forward from here? Uh, farm bill, permitting, uh, CDRLA, you know, what gets you all super excited um, uh, coming down the pike? Um, I'm happy to um, start that one. Um, but before I answer, well, I've seen a couple of questions here about like where to go to look for federal funding opportunities. One thing I wanted to note on this, um, that I think somebody linked it somewhere. Um, I spent a lot of time putting together with my colleagues a database. It's free. It's it's not paywalled. You can go look at it now on our on our website um, for basically the list of opportunities across both DOE, all the applicable agencies. Um, the difficult thing when you're looking through this, and I really, I was actually hopeful when I saw there was like a launch of the, like White House did a like clean energy um, website yesterday, which is really excited. It's very consumer facing, like it's not really for businesses. A huge like pain in the butt is that there is really like SAM is okay. Um, uh, Fed Connect is okay, but it's like really difficult to search for like um, you know, these meaningful search criteria to, to search for what you're looking for. So you know, take a look at ours. I think you can also like there are when you go to DOE's website, there's you know FECM, there's like very specific um, kind of sub offices that will have the most directly applicable federal words for you all here. Sign up for those. Um, you'll get direct email updates on when there's a notice of intent, which is sort of like earlier stage, and then you know to the actual federal funding award. Um, anyway, sorry not to magnify, <laughs> um, I, I deviate too much, but just like structurally, as you're looking for those. Those email updates are great. Feel free to use our free resource as well. Um, on what I'm most excited about, you know, I will say this is, you know, not necessarily a popular opinion, um, you know, more broadly in the climate space and with our friends in the environmental community. But um, I think the permitting reform could be um, 
very helpful um, to to you know fighting and and um, and to really um, assisting with the speed in which projects get cited. Um, you know, love me, but. <laughs> It is our, you know, bed, bed, bedrock environmental law here, but, you know, I think um, anyone will tell you that it has, um, in some cases, you know, really um, stymied the, the progress of citing renewable um, energy. Uh, and so I, you know, I have there, there, it has already been circulated or it was leaked, but it is publicly available. I'm happy to share it. There was sort of a, I'm sure folks here um, have, have it, kind of a one pager that was circulated very high level about what those permitting reforms are sort of expected to take the shape of. I have no idea how far those negotiations have come since then. Um, but you know, the expectation is we'll take some form of that. Um, but I think generally speaking that, that, that those could um, potentially um, be very beneficial to the industry. Um, two, two things, I'll, I know we're kind of, I, I get the sense we're doing closing remarks sort of right now um, before we close up, but um, I would love to piggyback off of what Jaron was saying about permitting. Um, it is an incredibly difficult pill for some people to swallow because there's this false conception that um, permitting reform means you're getting around environmental regulation somehow, which is not what permitting reform is about. Um, there are, um, are very archaic laws around how we permit things in the US and to hit the climate targets, the extremely fast and important climate targets that we have, um, we're going to need to build like at lightning speed. And if we do any, like if, if we do even, um, you know, a, a, uh, if, if, if the past is any indicator of how we're going to build things in the future, um, we're in trouble. And, and so this is a bipartisan topic. We're actively tracking this. Um, and it is the thing that law lawmakers are discussing in the Capitol as we speak right now. So I, I do think that that's sort of the short term uh, conversation, whether or not something happens this year or next year is a separate question. Um, but uh, it's just a super important topic. Other thing I really want to plug real fast, because um, we, we didn't bring it up today. I know there's a lot of startups here today. Um, and, you know, I, there might have been some, some questions about how to plug into sort of earlier stage research dollars, like maybe the Small Business Innovation Grants Program, or who the R stands for, SBIR. Um, you know, Things like that. Um, we actually have a, a network of entrepreneurs at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, I just dropped a link in the chat. It's called the American Energy Innovation Network. What's unique about it is it's um, it's not really focused on carbon removal or carbon management, but it's sort of helping all energy startups um, kind of get connected to federal resources. Um, and I've asked my colleague at BPC, um, Natalie Tam, to sort of stick around um, in the networking part of this of this conversation afterwards. So if you if you spot her and have questions about the AEIN, I encourage you to ask them to her and also to sign up via the, the link I just dropped in the chat. Um, and I maybe pass to Caroline so she can have closing remarks too. But thanks so much for having me. Um, really appreciate this conversation. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning the AEIN, uh, Danny. It's 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 a real um, asset. Um, and, and we're happy to field some questions about that and share more information. I would just say really quickly, um, the funding that was made available through the IRA is fantastic, but there's so much more to be done. Um, there's going to be a ton of questions around implementation, um, you know, an effective implementation on the ground. That's going to look really different um, for the different programs and the different agencies, um, you know, for example, um, USDA knows what the practices are um, and where you know, producers may have interest in their uh, um, adoption with regard to like changes in forest management and harvest cycles and tillage and, and application of fertilizers. Um, but there's still gonna be a lot of questions around implementing to optimize the opportunity for carbon management um, and CDR, and then also how to engage smaller um, or underserved producers um, ensure more equitable access to this funding, um, which is, you know, another another um, area of consideration. So there's going to be a lot of important work to be done um, in in implementing these dollars, um, you know, effectively and equitably. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline, and oh, thank, thank you, Danny, you. and thank you, Jaren. Jaren, you had something to say? Sorry, didn't mean Sorry. to. Sorry. <laughs> One more thing, because I, I know there are a couple of questions on kind of regulatory timelines across all of these bills. Um, one thing I would say is when you look at the timelines, because they are actually in the bill sometimes, um, 
those are often kind of sailed right through, unfortunately. And that's not a, a you know, aspersion to the agencies. Like we've just wrote these massive, massive bills and they are trying their level best to do these um, both well and fast, which is a tough thing to do. <laughs> um, on that note though, the most important thing I wanted to highlight to the extent anyone here is interested in CHIPS programs, the most important thing I want to note about those is that the CHIPS programs at the Department of Energy, the vast majority of them, if not all of them, were not actually funded. They were authorized but not funded. What that means for timeline is that that's going to need an appropriations bill to actually fund those programs. If you see a really exciting opportunity in CHIPS, it's probably not coming down the pike for much longer, you know, necessarily than something in the bipartisan infrastructure law or IRA, because like that money is literally not sitting in the sort of like figurative DOE um, bank account yet. So just as you're thinking about it, CHIPS is going to take longer, IRA and bill, the money is there, it is appropriated, they're ready to go. Got it. Got it. And Danny also mentioned that we didn't talk at all about the these uh, DAC hubs you might have uh, heard a little bit about, but uh, more to come on that in the near future, I'm sure. Uh, once again, thank you, Caroline and Jaron and Danny, and especially to Mac, our moderator. Uh, really appreciate all the insights that were shared today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next year Managers event. I shared some links in the chat for the post-event survey. We'd love to hear what you thought of how we did, whether we hit the mark, whether we didn't, and what we can do to improve. Uh, especially any kind of feedback, uh, good, bad, and different. That's what we want to hear so that we can make a better a presentation to you, our audience. So with that, I'm going to say thank you once again. Oh, one, one final note. Uh, our next event is going to be two weeks time about soil carbon MRV. And we've got an excellent couple of speakers lined up for that. Uh, that's already been advertised on our events calendar, which you can click to through the link that I provided. So once again, thank you everyone. And we're going to hang on for networking for a little while. Hope to see you there.